Um, okay, I'm going to hand over to, to Vim now. He's going to introduce Marin. Okay, thank you, Orla. Oh. Yes. Um, yeah, my name is Wim van Peterem. I come from uh, the University of Leuven. Um, and it's an honor to present to you uh, the second keynote speaker for this conference, uh, Dr. Marin Deepwell. Uh, I hope I pronounced it correctly. It's, I've been told it's a Danish name. Marin is the chief executive of uh, ALT, the Association for Learning Technology, the leading professional body for learning technology in the UK, with uh, over 3,000 members. She has led the organization since 2012, including a strategic transition to becoming a virtual team in uh, 2018, before the pandemic. Her particular focus is on professional recognition for learning technologists, the development of a new ethical framework for professional practice, and the future of technology and education. She is a trained sculptor and anthropologist, and she will bring both her creative and executive expertise to her professional practice as a leader, strategic advisor and coach, and also as a keynote speaker today. The title of her presentation will be Hope on the Horizon. And if you remember the first keynote speaker that was about Hope Punk, we can make the link here. Marin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for this warm introduction. I feel so welcome here. This is my first ever Eden annual conference, and I very much hope it won't be the last one. It is such a privilege for me here to share this stage with so many colleagues from so many different countries. And having been involved in just a few big conferences myself in the last 10, 15 years, I really want to take this opportunity to give a huge shout out to all of our colleagues from Eden and from DCU. I don't think we're seeing 10% of the effort they're putting in to pull this all together. So please do put your hands together. <laughs> Marvelous conference. Now, being the last keynote is always a pleasure. I have been able to sit Sunday, Monday, and today and listen and be inspired. <laughs> but I'm also a little bit intimidated because the lineup has been fabulous and it's daunting to follow in the footsteps of all these inspiring talks. We already heard um, Rika's keynote who opened and set the tone, encouraging us to adopt and explore all possible futures. And then a big highlight for me was to see Catherine Cronin and Laura Chernovich talking about their forthcoming edited volume, Created Visions for Higher Education for Good. And I also really enjoyed a leaflet that I picked up, a commented atlas on hacking innovative pedagogy, which included five rules. And the first one of which I believe said something like technology isn't neutral. And wherever I went in this conference yesterday and today, I found more inspiration. I also found some really personal, vocational stories of how we can make change, including Eamon Costello's storytelling kindness in teacher education. So what I've experienced here in Dublin is that we are creating a tapestry of hope, showing how care and kindness can play a role in shaping education for good. And I hope that this is what I can contribute to here at Eden today. Because partly we're here because we recognize that knowledge sharing and dissemination and collaboration are really fundamental to our work. And sometimes over the past five years, we certainly haven't had enough time of that, particularly not during the dark days of crisis. And we've heard so much in the last few days, so many reminders that the pandemic isn't over, that the impact of it is very much still with us. I want to acknowledge those of us who couldn't make the time to be here, who felt so much pressure, so much work, so much catching up that they can't make the time to be here with us today, who are battling burnout and who are really at the end of their tether. Because we've all been in a crisis situation, we've seen what's possible and that's been so amazing, but we also know that crisis provision isn't what we're looking for. These 12, 14, 16, 18 hour days is not what we're looking for when we're thinking about a sustainable future. This is one of my favorite places in this conference. I've been walking up and down this corridor with great joy, not just to lunch and back, but it's really reminded me of the spectrum of light, the spectrum of possibilities that we're here to explore. 
Because what I hope we're not here to do is to create more dichotomies, small gulfs between in-person and online, between machines and human beings. What I'm hoping we are here for is to really think about that full spectrum of the toolkit at our disposal, from analog to digital, and to really value all different elements of that for what they're valuable for. So where do we start from creating this vision in which we can move towards a future? Where do we look when we want to see beyond the hype of technology? So what I'm interested in, in the next sort of 20 minutes, half an hour, is to think about the time of change and recovery that we're in, and how we find a vision that includes that full spectrum of possibility. So, as we heard earlier, my career started not in educational technology, but in art and anthropology, and in the world of material and visual culture where digital tools were as much part of my day-to-day -day work as hammer and chisel or pen and paper. And the interplay between technology and learning in the context of those types of professional practices are very much about fostering creativity and empowering the imagination. When I was at art school, whatever we could think of, we found a way of creating. So when I think about the future, when I think about the direction we might be taking after we leave here today, I'm really inspired by these words, one of my all-time favorite writers. It is above all by the imagination that we achieve perception and compassion and hope. And I hope that this quote sets a little bit of a context and gives you a bit of a flavor of what I'm hoping to speak about. Now, as the Chief Executive of the Association for Learning Technology, I've spent the last 15 years working with and for a community that was established to lead on the effort of embedding technology and learning, teaching, and assessment. And we have very much in common with our colleagues from Eden here, but very much the same kind of community. And I'm aware that some of the people leading the association, um, two of our trustees are in the audience, so I just wanted to give a shout out to, to Sharon Flynn and to Peter Bryant. Thank them for being so much part of our community. And also, I wanted to give a big shout out um, to Laurie Phipps, who's here as the co-chair of our annual conference this year, which I hope will bring together a lot of these important discussions that we are having, just like we're having them in Dublin today. Now, one of the things that's inspired me most about working in this community is working with the individuals, the managers, the leaders who lead on this change, who really grapple with these issues day to day. And sadly, after 15 years, I am preparing to step down as CEO in September this year. And so I want to encourage you to continue to reach out to the association and be active in the work that we do as we hand over to our next CEO, Billy Smith. And I really look forward to continuing work in the sector in a different capacity as a consultant and as a coach. But for now, today, I still have that privilege one more time to share the work of ALT with you. And I wanted to highlight to you our values that we have as a community of openness. We've heard a lot about today, particularly in the debate around the future of open education. Collaboration, participation, and independence with our 3,500 uh, 3, members at the heart of everything we do. And I've been really interested yesterday to hear from colleagues um, from America, from the Online Learning Consortium, again, an organization with whom we have much in common. And learning technologists, by whatever title, are very much at the heart of a lot of the things that we've talked about in this conference. And I wanted to bring along a definition that you know, has evolved but has also stood the test of time in the last 30 years to share with you how we interpret these terms as they evolve. Because I think the language that we use to describe what it is that we do is very, very important. And one of the things I want to come back to is this wider context of policy, theory, and history, which we see very much as fundamental to the ethical, equitable, and fair use of technology in education. Now, 10 years ago, when we celebrated 20 years of old, 
Um, higher education was buffeted. I know many of you in this room will remember. Um, very much quoted report at the time, The Avalanche is Coming, one of the Sir Michael Barber reports. And the avalanche in question in 2013 was the MOOCs. The MOOCs were coming in 2012, the year of the MOOC, and our future then, higher education and educational technology, was very much a contested landscape. And over the past 10 years, I feel, our landscape has only become more contested. And today at this conference, we've heard mercifully little about chat GPT and AI. But I want to look back 10 years ago when the urgency of that avalanche threatening to engulf us all and you know, stop higher education as we knew it was very much at the forefront of many people's minds. And I feel we're at, in a similar moment in history at the moment where another um, avalanche is threatening us or at least threatening a lot of change in a way that many people feel worried about. So this is why I think it's so important that we continue to develop those mature, reflective approaches, something that I was very inspired by hearing Melissa Bond speaking about earlier today with the sort of lack of reflection highlighting that in educational technology research. Thinking about a more critical perspective around our professionalism and our vision in an age of automation, AI, and technological determinism. So 2013's metaphorical avalanche may have come and gone, and we have weathered it. But I want to think about the wider context in which the current wave of change is hitting us, the landscape of current practice. And to explore that, I want to share some findings of what current practice looks like from a UK perspective and how that shapes our future. So coming to some trends in learning technology from the old annual survey. Our survey, very much like the Eden Fellow survey that we heard Antonio and Deborah speak about earlier at the conference, sits alongside other studies and other benchmarking exercises such as JISC's work on sector analysis and the UK USISA digital capabilities survey, also similar European reports um, on blended learning and making education more inclusive. And this work is really helpful for our membership, but it's also helpful for us from a policy point of view, as it in helps to inform our policy responses at a national level, for example, um, responding to the recent UK Office for Students review of blended learning. Now, I want to share a couple of trends with you um, and then highlight some specific findings as we have a look at the survey results. And one of the things that has very much changed in the last few years, particularly since the pandemic, is that over 75% of institutions are seeing hybrid and blended models of learning becoming dominant. And correspondingly, digital strategy and leadership are now at the very top of the agenda. And what sits behind these figures is a high level of change management at all levels of organizations specifically building those digital skills and digital literacies for staff and learners. Digital transformation, at least in my experience, has become a constant, not an endpoint to aim for. Facilitating effective and engaging collaboration together with the assessment for blended learning are likewise at the top of the agenda, as you can see, and in a really welcome change from the last few years where when we asked for the top 50 tools, the only answers that we got were Teams and Zoom and Teams and Zoom ad nauseum. Over 50 different tools have been nominated and I think that shows a really wonderful return to a more broad, more creative, more expansive practice in learning technology. And here's just a detailed view about the main mode of learning at this time that we saw in the UK. So this was January this year, and um, it gives you a sense of the change and the scale at which this change is happening. And that change means that dedicated time is at a premium because all of our workloads, all of us are working on this effort, workloads are remaining very high. And that is one of our biggest challenges, I think, coming out of the pandemic. Very few of us have had any breathing room whatsoever. And we're looking to continue that change, that transformation piece at pace. 
And I think there's also a point here for us to reflect on whom the last few years have impacted most and the inequities that the impact reflects. Because I think one of the things we've all found during the pandemic is that it's only highlighted the inequalities in terms of access to technology, access to infrastructure, access to skills and skills development for both learners and for staff. And those challenges are very much still at the heart of what we're grappling with. Now, in order to meet these challenges, we are seeing a huge growth in the recruitment of roles at all different sector levels. Um, and one of the things that makes my life very difficult representing three and a half thousand people is that all of them have a different job title and all of them are very, very much politicized around what their job title might mean. So if you have very strong feelings about learning design, instructional design, learning technology, being an ICT lead, being head of digital, head of digital transformation, or maybe one of the plethora of other job titles, I salute you. I respect the work you do and there are so much kudos to you. Digital education at scale is very messy and it needs all of you. It's time consuming and it's not a quick fix. <laughs> and to the disappointment of many senior leaders in our sector, it's no cheaper than not doing it with technology. But I do want to really make this point that we're not really seeing just people with more digital skills being recruited. You know, digital skills are very important. I don't want to take away from that. But we're also talking about people who have that ability at different levels of the organization to work like a translator, to understand the, pro the problems, rather, and the perspective of an academic from a specific discipline, of a learner from a different learner population, a senior manager who's looking at the budget line, a policymaker who might sit on a funding pot, I think all of us who identify with some spectrum of this job title, I would call myself a learning technologist in a leadership position. And for me too, that translation piece of translating different parties from different perspective is absolutely key. And I think it's really highly undervalued in the language that we use to talk about digital skills and digital literacies. We are capable and we are needed in so many more ways. Now, a second report builds on this, also from our annual survey, with a focus on professional development. Because if we do have to have such a broad skill set, how do we develop that? Where do we get that from? And how do we grow and recruit and induct more people early in their career into this space? I'm particularly um, interested in showing the broad range of types of roles we're talking about here, teaching, research, management and leadership, support, administration, staff development and training, as well as technical support. And I think in addition to what I just mentioned around that translation piece between different parts of the institutions, I think in recent years, we've added an added bit of complexity to that brief as well, which is the hybrid working, flexible working virtual teams piece. And I've been involved in quite a few recruitment exercises for senior staff recently, and none of them had very much experience in effectively leading at a senior level on a hybrid or virtual context, because there's just not that many people particularly not in our part of the world, who have that experience as yet. So now when we're recruiting, we're not looking for someone to just talk the talk. We're also looking for someone to walk the walk in virtual and hybrid teams and model that, importantly, for the learners who are then going into workplaces where that is required too. Now, Again and again, over the last few days, we've heard that the way we are doing things is changing. I was very struck by the results of the Eden survey, but also what colleagues from OLC shared around how much the way institutions are doing business is changing. And I think that is one of the reasons why many people in our sector feel that structural support for their role is lacking, although professional development opportunities when it comes to all things digital might be increasing. I think it's a sign that whilst the recognition for what we do is growing, 
our understanding of the kind of expertise that we really need is very patchy. And the kinds of roles that we need can sit in all different places within an institution. And importantly, are situated in all different places within existing power structures that dominate those institutions. So I just want to pause for a moment here before I go on to the next part of my talk to come back to that bigger picture. Because I shared the survey data with you to give you a sense of the wider context that we're seeing for professional practice. And I think what I want to emphasize and what I'm sure will ring true to all of you is that within very different structures and institutional levels and at national level, there's a recognition now that digital is no longer an optional add-on or something that's nice to have. Instead, learning technologists by whatever job title have become more and more a core part of all learning and teaching and assessment, and by extension, the way we work as well. We're at the forefront of the effort to scale up digital education and to show that this effort goes beyond embedding technology in a strategy and taking it for granted that the necessary change will follow. So many institutions, I think, take the word digital and put it in their learning and teaching strategy and then think proudly, job done. This is going to be revolutionary embedding digital in our institution at a strategic level. But I think those people who I work with actually are at the forefront of making those changes at all different levels of seniority and staff happen. And this is the piece that I'm really interested in, because this is where the magic really happens. And at the core of the work that Alt does, and over the past, I think, 11 or 12 years now, our professional accreditation scheme has been really the beacon around which we do this work, the beacon at which we look at professional accreditation and skills development. And I wanted to highlight this because we've done some interesting research around looking at all the different hundreds of professionals who've gone through the scheme and looking at what they choose as a specialism, what they care to highlight, what they want to shine through. And just giving you a little bit of a glimpse of quite a comprehensive data set of what the variety of that kind of um, work has become and what kind of a variety of specialist areas we're seeing, even in that just one community that we are looking at here. Hopefully, you'll get a chance to have a look at these reports and do a little bit of a deeper dig. But one point that I wanted to make, which I personally think is especially interesting, is that looking at these specialist areas and looking at particularly the reflective parts, which are a core requirement of the CMOLD accreditation process. I think we can see that negotiating process of what sort of future we want to have in practice that both Melissa referred to today and also Rike, who spoke of the spectrum of futures and encouraged us to think what we dream about and what we hope for instead of just responding to the perceived needs or threats of technology in the classroom. And I think by putting reflection at the core of our accreditation scheme and at the core of professional recognition, we offer professionals an opportunity to hold themselves accountable to think about those broader futures, to think beyond the you know, immediate requirements of what's needed in the next lesson, in the next classroom. And ultimately, to reflect on how we can create a more hopeful vision. Now, I haven't had much time today to go more into this, but I do hope that you'll take an opportunity to learn more about the scheme if you're not already familiar with it. And building both on the survey data and the CMOLD framework, I now want to return in the last part of my talk to the wider context of ethical and equitable professionalism, specifically this framework for ethical learning technology that was developed by all members over the past few years. And again, I want to give a big shout out to one of our trustees, Sharon Flynn, who is in the audience, who is one of the leads of our working group, together with Bella Abrams and Natalie Lafferty. Um, the work started in October 2020 and has been ongoing since, and involved a huge amount of collaboration and consultation with professionals from different countries, and also learners and representatives from industry. 
We started in January 2021 to work on drafting the ethical principles, um, which you can see on the screen here. And I'm aware this is not necessarily the best graphic. If you do have a look um, at the slides that I've shared, there is a link to different versions of the framework and also a text version if you'd like to have a bit more of a look at it. And these draft principles we put back out again for consultation and the resulting framework is not necessarily an end product, but a common baseline on which we said we could build the future work. And I want to give a special mention here to Rob Farrow, who's been absolutely instrumental in giving coherent content to the shape of input we receive from over 150 people with very strong views on ethics. So I can only pay testament to the fact that sometimes you really need a philosopher in educational technology. Now, I want to focus on practical aspects of making ethical, equitable practice in learning technology work on a day-to-day -day basis. And during the development of this framework, we gathered a really large number of resources and also references that informed the development. Um, again, I invite you to have a look on the website where you can have a look at all of these different references. But we very specifically mapped it back into our CMOLD framework in order to really show the close correlation between day-to-day -day professional practice for all professionals and ethical practice. Last year, we, um, for example, published the first set of practical resources, a self-assessment toolkit, which is openly licensed and freely available to all, um, which can be used for both teams and individuals. And this is very much a, a reflective questionnaire that you can use to reflect on a particular project, a new tool, um, a new platform, or you can use it to focus on a particular aspect of your work. And we actively encourage professionals in the sector to undertake the self-assessment and to reflect on their professional practice, and then based on the outcome of that assessment, move ahead with specific actions. There's a little bit more information about the assessment process, and I want to include a small call for action here because we're very much looking for individuals to share back examples of applying this framework. We do receive them again and again, but we're very much looking for your input to help continue the development of this work. To me, felt this framework offers a practical approach to tackling some of the most challenging aspects of shaping digital education, the fair, equitable, and ethical use of our technology. So, Building on what we see in this framework, I want to now take a moment to just reflect on the voices and viewpoints we may be missing, including or ignoring, and how the way in which we work, communicate and collaborate can, can help our effort to identify those blind spots that we all inevitably have and help bring more different voices into the conversation. And I want to use this example of a large national initiative that's currently happening in the UK, 18.9 million national drive towards a national collection, which aims to translate UK heritage into digital, more open, more inclusive heritage. And it's very much a collaborative online project uh, in which Alt plays a very, very small part, but we're very proud to be part of this effort. But I think it's given me a particular appreciation for how to translate stone and bronze and made materials and intangible materials that are very precious to many communities into something that's more accessible and contextualized. And great care is taken, just like we saw in an epic museum last night, to contextualize and to, to bring out those nuances to surface what really matters um, to the, the people involved in these stories. And similar to being here today, I find it's a huge privilege to being able to share this space with you and also seeing people on the live stream join the session. But there are so many people who are not present on part of these conversations. And I think that applies at all levels when we talk about, particularly when we sit in meeting rooms without Wi-Fi and we talk about the future of digital, which I experience surprisingly often. Um, but also when we sit in rooms like this where we are doing our best to share, I think there's always more that we can do. When it comes to strategy and policy, 
I don't think we need to focus exclusively on the subject at hand, but also on how we collaborate and how we communicate. It comes back to walking the walk of digital transformation at all levels of seniority and to gradually adapt our institutions and the structures within them. So we've heard a lot in the past three days about digital leadership and skills and capabilities which are at the forefront of this change. But it can be very hard for those of us trying to make this work out in practice to meet these competing priorities of the students and the staff, the funders, the policy makers, the institutions, and our own practice as well. It's really hard at times, I think, to be a good learning technologist. So when we think about our future, the future of digital education, I think we have to come back to that wider context I mentioned in the beginning policy, theory, and history, and a fewer references that I'd rather include in my talk than Audrey Waters' History of Teaching Machines, which really helps us understand that urgent call to not ignore our histories and the history of educational technology, but to think about the stories we tell of how we got here and how many of them they are and how many perspectives they are. So before we get to the end of the talk, um, I just wanted to share one more quote, which I came across in Catherine and Laura's inspiring um, methodology for their collected volume. And I wanted to just put this up on the screen and for us all to, to have a moment of reflection about what action we can take on an individual and institutional and national level to reject the notion that there's only that one dominant narrative that matters and to include other voices more stories about any person or place in our work here. And in order to live that a little bit in this room right now, I'm going to invite you all to make your voice heard as we close this talk and share something that's given you hope at Eden over the past few days. So I'm very um, grateful to Alan, who's here, who's going to help us with this poll. But you have a few minutes now to share something that's given you hope um, whilst I give my closing remarks. And then we'll bring up the, the slides. So for me, we started the conference exploring how we can imagine all possible and real futures and to move beyond just responding to the needs of technology, rejecting those single narratives, no matter how much like an avalanche and like an inevitability they may seem. And I'm hoping very much the hope punk paradise that Rika talks about so of eloquently is one that we can strive towards. And just like a quilt made from many different squares, and I particularly want to mention a wonderful example of the Femme Ed Tech quilt here, I think what we create here, that vision, must open up spaces for some unexpected patterns and colors and new strands and stories that are being incorporated. So, Alan, how are we looking with the responses? Okay, anybody else wants to get in there? You have one more minute, and then we'll bring it up onto the screen. Yes, please, that would be great. I think we're all curious to see. Fantastic. So I'm going to just pause here for a minute so we can all have a look as the remaining responses come in. Thank you so much for making your voice heard and for playing along. <laughs> I think the Hope Punk merch um, stand is going to open in a foyer just in a minute. Um, but just to close then, I really hope that just like it has for me, this conference has helped fill your imagination. I know it's not over yet. There's more inspiring sessions in store this afternoon. And that we can take a little bit of that yes we can attitude back when we go back to our communities as well. And a very small PS from me, and I'll bring that up on the slides in a moment. Um, as part of the research for this keynote, I came across um, a children's book by the same title, Hope on the Horizon which is a children's handbook on empathy, kindness, and making the world a better place. So I think that sounds like a great read um, for any of you who have young people in their lives. And if I could get the final closing slide up when you guys are ready, um, I just want to say a big thank you for having me. Thank you, Eden.
Thank you very much, uh, Maren, for this uh, inspiring and hopeful uh, keynote speech. Um, now uh, we still have plenty of time for questions. Um, who in the room would like to ask a hopeful question? Oh. It's hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> it was hopeless after the, <laughs> the lunch. Uh, but maybe I can start, uh, if, you, if you don't mind. Um, at a certain point, you were uh, showing, I think, the, the uh, important factors. Uh, and, and one of the factors was, uh, the, the first one, I think, was dedicated time, uh, was um, a very important factor for, for learning technologies and, and, and people in the field, let's say. Uh, if, you, that if, if you would like to link that then with, with hope, um, what would be the hope that you could give to us that uh, time would probably, well, that it will be solved at a certain point? Uh, or is there no hope? Um, no, I think there absolutely is. And I, I think the, the trick that we have to pull off in our, our field is that whilst the goalposts keep moving, we have to find a moment to reflect, to celebrate, to mark our own achievements. And I think I've never met a professional class of people who've been harder on themselves. Because every time we think we've solved one problem, then there is the next technology that poses new problems. And students are generally ahead of the, the game for us. So we're always playing catch up. And I think just like we're doing here today now, having those moments to actually mark what we've achieved and to take a breath and say, that's good enough for now. You know, there'll be always something more on the horizon. I think that is part of what I hope we can achieve as professional bodies to help professionals do in the sector. So I'm not sure I can magically line manage more time into everybody's schedules, yeah. but I think that moment of celebration and reflection is really essential. Okay, thank you. Uh it was a very good question from you, Wim. Uh, so I wanted to provide my answer as well. I, I think that all of us here is actually the hope that we want to pass all the obstacles and move on to find the best way how to ensure that student has the best possible education. Uh, or not student, just the children and everyone uh, it can be. So I think that all of us here are the hope, actually. Uh, but maybe question for, for you, uh, um, how to decide when to set up the line the, 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 when, when it's the best, or we should always be looking further? Oh, that's a great question. I guess, I guess that, that line is never there, you know, because I think our work is never finished. But I think what, what it reflects is how much we care about education and how much that matters to us. And I think we've had a lot of conversations in recent months about the value of being a human being, particularly if there is a technology solution that could be more time effective or cost effective or just outright better. And I think your answer is very much my answer as well. It's us who matter. It, if we care that human beings are at the forefront of education, then they will continue to be. And I think that is what I think that that's where the line is. It's us for us to draw that line. I like the thing about the, the perma crisis or the pedagogy of crisis and how we should move away from that. Here's Louise Drum. Thanks, Louise. Hi, Maren. Thanks. I love that. Um, I suppose one of the things I'm, I'm aware of when I was, uh, you know, listening to a lot of the people um, speaking and presenting at the conference over the past couple of days, that not everybody would have probably identified themselves as a learning technologist, but actually we are all a little bit learning technologist now, um, and that's kind of a beautiful thing. And there's a plurality in that. And I just wonder if you have any reflections of coming back out of, you know, the pandemic years that we're going through at the moment. And you know, there was the, the superheroes in, in capes that came and, and rescued a lot of uh, institutions um, in the form of learning technologists at that time. And do you think, what's the, what's the next hopeful thing you know, that learning technologists um, can, can bring to, to all of the communities and each of us as a, being a little bit learning technologist? I think a hopeful thing would be to say that as a community, we can educate those who sit at the top of the power structures 
that although the crisis may be receding, the voice of the people with the expertise is no less needed or no less important. I think we've seen quite a few institutions hoping to, you know, go back to normal, revert to, you know, the, the fabled piece of in-person um, in person learning, as if that didn't involve any technology nowadays. And I guess what I really hope is that we can move forward into a future where we have a seat around all the tables, because I think that's the point I was trying to make in my talk. It's not really about helping one lecturer in one subject, in one classroom, doing one thing. It's about the whole piece now, and it extends to work and strategy and policy and teaching and learning and assessment, and it's just part of the whole equation. And I think we have a lot of opposition because there are a lot of people in power who you know, aren't learning technologists or identify like that, who are like, wait a minute, I'm responsible for this. No, no, this is my IT service or library or academic design or whatever it is. And I think that, that is where the piece of translating between the different parties really comes in. But it isn't an easy job, I, I think, you know, but I, I very much like the idea that we do have, we are empowered to, to lead that change. So I hope that's answered your question. Can I, can I build a little bit further on that Please. translating that you mentioned? Because mm -hmm. um, at a certain point you were indeed talking about digital skills uh, mm -hmm. as is one thing that we, uh, and we already talked a lot about that also in the conference. Um, but you, you mentioned the second uh, skill, let's say, is being a translator. Um, what, uh, how can we work on that? Uh, I mean, uh, d digital skills, we, we by now know how to define them, how to grow, uh, how to professionalize in digital skills. Well, we should know. But uh, when it comes to being a translator, how do we do that? I think that's where the anthropologist in me comes to the fore. Because I think we all, as learning technologists, has to have to understand more about what's going on in the different elements of our institution, the academic, the student body, support services. And we have to understand a little bit of all of them, what's important to them, and why they should use technology in a way that you know, is effective and efficient and has good outcomes on the learner experience. And I think that's where that translation piece is really important is if you, um, I think I had earlier in, the, um, in one of the talks that people just didn't want to do digital. And no matter how much you said to them, this is the future, I think it was the, um, the colleague um, from Limerick who was talking about teachers who were just saying, no, I don't want to do this. I'm not interested. Blended learning, no, I'm in the classroom, that works, that's what I need to do. And I think that's where the translation piece comes in. If we don't understand what's important to that teacher, we can't convince them that it's useful to use technology. And that goes at all levels of seniority, you know, up to ministers and, and policy makers. We need to understand what is their priority, what are they trying to achieve, and how can we help them achieve that with technology. And that is where I think the translation piece comes in. And that is why I think it's so important that we understand our own institutions or learning communities so that we can help them understand where we're coming from. And I think that's a really key skill that all really successful learning technologists have in buckets. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat>Okay, folks, um, so now we have breakout sessions. Following that, fishbowl. That's going to be good. And then the conference closing. Okay, so uh, breakout sessions first. Okay, thanks. Anyone who didn't like the talk.